Welcome, everyone. My name is Lance Knuckles. I have the privilege of being the Deputy Executive Director of St. Louis Development Corporation, as well as the Director of LRA. I'm encouraged to be here today to find ways to support all of you in growing your business. And so today, our purpose here is to really understand the impact that COVID has had on your business and continues to have on your business as we need to identify resources, tools, relationships that allow this part of Del Mar and all of Del Mar to continue to grow and thrive. And so today's purpose is about gathering impact statements. And so the session will go as follows. We will call on every business owner who is present. I will ask you to state your business name, who you are and your relationship to the business, and then give you two to three minutes to talk about how your business has been impacted, some of the things you've been doing to stay afloat, and some of the things that you need to be able to move forward into the future. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. I will also, after this event tomorrow, there will be an impact statement email to everyone who signs in to have you capture your statement in writing as well so that I have the tools I need to be able to fight for the resources to support you all getting access to things to help you move forward, okay? And so that'll be the order of the day. I will not take any more time and I'll ask uh, one, a couple of folks, I wanna say thank you to Del Mar Main Street for helping coordinate this event. I also wanna say thank you to Triple A Fish for hosting today. And I don't know if the owner would love to say anything uh, to folks here before we get going. Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to Triple A Fish House and I'm glad that you all came out to support this cause. I'm grateful for Tamika that has gotten behind this uh, cause that we need to do um, to let us know that we, are being, we have been impacted too by COVID. Not just a few of us, but a lot of us small business and we need this grant just as bad as anybody else do you know uh, I'm not gonna hold up the mic once again I'd like to thank everybody for coming welcome you all please come back again and feel free if anything you need let me know thank you so we just heard from Lance about what he is why he is here but we also as business owners we have a, something else that we want to discuss too because they're if you, if you don't know why we're here, it's because the grant has come out. We were not included in the grant. So there are things that we want to ask of you here today, too, in terms of timelines and things like that, so that we're not just here speaking to be speaking. Um, the things that we want to talk about is when will we know what's the, the process? Um, we want to put a timeline to things so that they're just not out here lingering and we're just wondering. So what we're asking of you, Lands, can you give us a timeline? We have an idea of when we would like to know something back, um, but we want to hear from you. What's the timeline? We get up here and say these impact statements. We are grateful that you're working on our behalf. Um, this is a big deal that he is working on our behalf, that the East Loop, which is main, main our, our, di our businesses are located, were not included in this, uh, the first round of these funds. So we don't want to just stand up here and speak. We want to put some concrete time measurements to what we're asking and what we're doing. So after we speak here today, there's a, how, how, let's roll this out so we know what to expect and when. So as far as some of us have, got, have gotten together and talked about this, we would like to know, is it possible for us to hear something back by the end of August? We know it's the beginning of July. We're speaking. We know you need time to do what you need to do, to gather everything that you need. Can we find out something by the end of August, where this is going? Yes. Okay, so by the end of August, we'll know what's going on. And the, the other thing also, as we're saying our impact statements, we have to also know that what are we talking about in terms of this grant? We weren't the only people left out. 
I'm, I'm raising hell today because all of us need to be included. My, my goal is to have this thing put on pause for a moment so all the businesses in North City can have a fair shot at receiving the money that's out here for us. It's not just about us, it's not about me, it's about all of us to make this an equitable process. We need to, to be able to know that, how are we gonna bring in those other businesses that have been left out? What can we do so that all the other small businesses, that once they learn about it and they say, oh, we don't fall in the corridor either, we were left out. What can we do to make it so that all the businesses have a fair share of getting some grant money? Okay. Uh, I'll definitely do my very best to communicate clearly about where SLDC is within this process and what we can do to support this work moving forward. But as I stated, the first part of this is really about gathering impact statements. And then I would love to engage in a conversation with you all about ideas and strategies that are coming from community about how to have this work be more inclusive. And so, Ms. Lisa, can you, you want to help coordinate getting folks up with me? and we can just call businesses up and they can do their impact statements. My name is Karen Bales. I am the owner of Bales Brothers Shrimp Chicken and Fish. Um, I am part owner with that with my husband, Eric Bales. Uh, we've actually been in business over 15 years, but um, only a year over here on Del Mar. Um, and I'm sorry, what am I? So, um, okay, so um, I feel that um, we should be a part of the funds that are given to us because there are things that we would love to do with our business. Um, patio fix up, inside fix up. So there's a lot of things that we could possibly do. A lot of marketing uh, should be available for us to utilize. Um, again, we just want to be a part of it. We want to feel like we're a part of something. We don't want to be left out because of where we're located. And as a black business owner, we're oftentimes left out of funds that's due to us. So, thank you. So my name of the business, or the name of my business is Crab Teams. Um, we are a seafood restaurant not too far from here. And um, Cortez is my partner. My name is Craig Scott. And the impact of COVID, just like everybody else, you know, um, COVID affected us greatly. We were a, a new restaurant. We went from one restaurant to eight restaurants in two, three years, and then COVID hit. And so we closed four of them. Um, so, I mean, it had an it had impact on us from everywhere from, um, you know, customers coming in, not coming in at first, to um, slowly starting to trickle back in. But then you had all the issues with the supply chain. And so once COVID was kind of worked out and kind of, you know, passed a little bit, but then you have all the issues with, supplies and, 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 and the cost of food and all that type of stuff. Um, and our food is, the food that we buy, specifically crab legs, is also generated by the market. So on top of us getting hurt from COVID, they had a bad market that year. And so crab prices, we went from $300 a case to $600 a case, crab legs. And so for a 30 pound back box of crab legs, um, and so that was as a result of COVID and then, and then additional things, um, you know, and then the whole process as far as getting um, EIDL loans and all that stuff, that stuff was all, it was rolled out so fast that it wasn't any organization. And so, you know, um, that made that process hard. Yeah, I mean, so we lost employees. Of course, we lost revenue um, or revenue um, pre-COVID was $2.5 million. We went, you know, we lost probably about a, a million and a half of that. We went down a million dollars. Um, I mean, everything, you know, employees, everything. So uh, we still being affected by COVID, as a matter of fact, so. What do you need? Um, we need money. <laughs> uh, we need money to, um, to continue, you know, to operate. Because things, even though COVID it's not in the eye as much as it was. There's still a lot of effects from COVID. Um, everything from, like I said, the employees, we don't have enough employees um, to, you know, a as far as still working through the supply chain issues and stuff. So, I mean, the first thing we need is funding. So, yeah. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, Wasim with St. Louis Grills over there on Del Mar right here. Uh, I'm the manager. And uh, the impact on COVID we had was basically 
a uh, shortage of supplies for the store. Uh, the price of gold drastically went up during COVID and it's continuing to go up. However, what I'm doing with that is uh, I'm keeping my prices down for my consumers. That way they keep coming in. And uh, right now it's deeply impacting us right now. What else hit us was our e-commerce. That went away pretty much because all of our customers would come from out of town. And now they just don't want to come in no more because of COVID. So uh, that's also playing a big part in us. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, and then our manufacturer of the jewelry, that's also being a big part because we get our jewelry from overseas, our diamonds and everything. So that's really taking a big uh, toll on what we got going on. Uh, we're trying to bring, you know, you know, some nice fashion and hip chop jewelry to our city. However, you know, COVID has uh, played a big part of like not letting that happen. You know what I'm saying? So it's like the, the shipment and everything is not coming in on time. And uh, we just really having big problems with that. And uh, what we want to do with like the funds that we're going to get going is uh, fix our e-commerce, fix the website we have going on for our consumers. Uh, so that way, you know what I'm saying, as far as social distancing, you know, they'll uh, be able to, uh, you know, safely uh, get what they want out of the website. And also uh, the, the store uh, also took a big toll. You know, we uh, got a few things going on over there, like people came in and busted everything we had to keep on fixing everything so we took we took a hit on that uh no one funded that for us so that pretty much came out of pocket and we just took the hit on that and uh a lot of people are just scared to come out nowadays because of covid so uh you know we we, we still we're still working on like revamping the website the store and uh we're trying to keep everything you know the neighborhood happy with everything we got going on and uh, hopefully, with this uh, impact payment we got going on, we could uh, help, you know, revolutionize the neighborhood in Delmar. My name is Valerie Smith. I am a neighbor. I, I, I'm a resident. I am a resident in the West End. Um, I have a music school, and I teach privately, a violin school of music. So. What bothers me here, right here, with impact statements is, is that our business owners don't really have anything to look at uh, in referencing to say what impact is. Because if funds were given to Union, to, to Taylor, um, they knew exactly why they were given those funds. I don't, were there impact statements given for those funds to be? allocated from Union to Taylor. I don't think there were. So you're asking I'm asking a question. Uh, I believe there were not. There were not. So there should be some kind of list that they can say an impact to. You know, what would the funds go, why did, were the funds allocated there and not allocated here? And then what impacts are they looking at to fund? I can help you with that, sir. Thank you. you stay right here with me. Yeah. Right here. So, so to be extremely transparent, a part of the conversation today is about Board Bill 82. Let's just put it on the table. I am not a legislator. I want to pause with you all for that a second. I do not craft legislation. That is not my job. It is my job to execute legislation okay. and move programs to the street. A part of the reason why I wanted to support and partner with this event and gather impact is to allow others who may not have understood the real needs of businesses to understand what those real needs are, gotcha. to help inform how decisions are made in the future, and to Sister Tamika's point, how we might look at making some short-term decisions to rectify or create opportunities to have equitable access to funds. Well, and I so, think that's a good thing because when people come up, instead of rambling, at least they can give something specific because it's hard when you don't really have that in front of you to ramble so, off what your impacts are. So, so I, I'm going to be biased, right? If, if I'm going to be biased in this moment and say all of you know exactly the impact of your business. You don't need me to write down a list of things for you to speak to you know your business better than anybody else. So that's why I didn't try to create some kind of script for something to speak to, 
is that your voice needs to be heard clearly from your perspective and vantage point, not through my perspective, but through yours specifically. So I understand that thought, but I need the voice of the businesses in this room to ring clear around the things that are impacting you in this moment to help me have resources to go to battle for you all. Okay? So business owners, be real specific. You know, that because I'm hearing because I'm here to support because I live in this community and I want to see you all soar because I'm a resident in this community. And so be real specific on the big dollar specifics on what you need. So that was, I just wanted to get some clarity there. Thanks. I'm Tamika Steigers. I own Locks of Glory Salon Spa and Black Beauty Supply. Since the grant came out, we have closed temporarily our beauty supply store because what do we need? Funding. So the impact that both of these businesses have on the community in St. Louis, we provide jobs. At Locks of Glory, we have 13 people that come to work at Locks of Glory, a mix between W-2 employees and 1099 employees. If we cannot have access to funding, to, we, we, we may have to close our doors. I know specifically of businesses that have closed their doors in the last few months. Therefore, we need to make sure we are doing what we need to do to support our businesses. And if there are funds, we need access to them. Every business in North City, if that's what our legislator said, they wanted to put dollars into North City. Last time I checked, my business is located in North City. Everybody in here has a business located in North City. So don't leave us out based on some arbitrary lines to keep, continue to divide us, okay? We, I've had to increase wages. As y'all know, it's hard to find help. It's hard to hire. Why? Because wages are going through the roof. I just had to increase our wages to $15 an hour to compete with places like McDonald's, to, comp to, to compete with places like Office Max and Home Depot, these big businesses that are pulling people in because they want to pay them more. Well, small business, I can't afford to pay people that amount. So I had to step out on faith and say, I know my workers are important to my business. I have to do what I got to do to find the money to pay our support staff, okay? So we care about our community. We show up to events. We care about our neighbors. We, we help kids and back to school, haircuts, book bags. We do all these things, so don't leave us out. We've had to temporarily pause our beauty supply store, hoping that somehow maybe some funds will come um, in the next few months so we can get back to operating. We need education. A lot of our business owners need help with their uh, financial statements, need help with balance sheets, needs help with learning how to apply for loans. We need help, we need the assistance, so don't leave us out. It's not right and there's nothing equitable about it for us to look up the street and see our neighbors have access to funds, the same funds. That, and most of us business owners, a lot of us live in this same community where we work and where we have our business. So what are we doing? We're paying taxes. They taking that 1% city tax. We're paying our, our local, our uh, state tax and our federal taxes. So don't leave us out. Business owners, you're in here, you know what you need. What do I need? Go look at my, the outside of my building. I need facade money. I need to, to, to take those windows out that are not efficient and put in some efficient windows so that we're not losing heat and we're not hot in the summer and cold in the winter. I need money to, to update some of the equipment inside of my salon. I need money to, to push our e-commerce because right now everybody is shopping online. I'm not an expert at, at any of that. So I need access to those who are the experts in it. And I'm sure there are other businesses as well had to do this whole pivot because of COVID and do a lot of things online. And we're used to, a lot of us are used to the face-to-face -face interaction and a lot of that was cut out during COVID. So yes, don't leave us out. We need access to the same funds that our neighbors and other business owners have access to. Hello, I'm LaBricia Straub. I own Elevator Learning Academy that's right down in this block. And we also own Black and Black St. Louis clothing across the street. So the impact that the daycare had on COVID, it was a terrible impact because we had the stay at home audience. So we was only able to care for emergency responders and certain people in healthcare. So we went from nine employees down to like four employees we, because of our capacity with the children. We was only able to care for so many children in the building. 
we was only able to care for so many children in, in the building at the time. So our capacity dropped. Our staff that we had started with, majority of them left. We probably had like two of them. You know, the business has been picking back up since then, but we still, like Tamika said, we can't compete with the big business like payroll, Walmart paying $18 an hour, Sam's paying $15 an hour. It's just hard to compete. People is leaving. We, early childhood providers, educators, we're like the lowest paying at this moment. Like, the most we can probably pay a person, you know, I just went from paying my workers $10 an hour to work. I tr I'm trying to keep you in the door to boost you up to twelve fifty. It's hard. They don't want to work for twelve fifty. That's not a livable wage at this moment. The PPP equipment, trying to keep the kids safe, trying to keep the staff safe, you know, all that stuff, that's, that's very, very costly. We have, we did get a grant, but at the same time with the grant, that stuff go in as fast as it come out. It, it wasn't enough to stabilize or help the business. When we're feeding kids, when we're paying payroll, utilities, rent, I pay over $6,000 of rent just right there, and I wasn't even barely making the income, but still having to pay for my workers. Another big thing that had impacted us with COVID, oh, I'm sorry, y'all, I didn't know I was going to be speaking today. <laughs> and so then with the clothing store, we had opened that up right when COVID hit. We had to close down. We didn't even get, get it up off the um, ground. You know, it was just at a pause for like at least like six, seven months. Then we was just like, let's just try it, open it up. We got to open it, business still slow. Who all trying, wasn't too many people buying clothes due to COVID. So we just need help. We need like a lot of help. We need funding. We need people, you know, we need gloves, masks. We need payroll to be able to increase. I was recently a provider where I wasn't so competitive with my rates at the childcare. So I used to try to like, we live in a poverty area. I was trying to help parents at a poverty market. I can't now. I just recently like increased my um, child care to where my parents, you know, they suffering at the at this time. It's like they can't pay it. But if they can't pay it, then I gotta shut my doors because what I use, I went from ninety five dollars a week to now two hundred and forty five dollars a week. That's like a big jump. But it had, like I say, I pay over six thousand in rent and fifteen thousand in payroll, and I probably bringing in twenty four thousand a month. So that's like ain't even one hand don't even wash the other. Then we closed over there now due to an accident. But it's like we were trying to piggyback out of each one of our businesses just to stay afloat, which, you know, at this point, like, we just need the funding. We need the help. We need people to come in and actually come and see our business. They could come and look at our books and see, hey, this business need this help. They need help with this, that, and the third. You know, they was giving us the, I think we had got like $500 grant last year, and I think they paid the rent once or something like that, but they didn't help because at the end of the day, it's like, if COVID numbers, they still rise. And so we still have to keep our capacity to a certain extent, just so we won't be closed. I haven't had any COVID outbreaks. I might've had one or two COVID cases, but it was per the family. So thank God we haven't had the close down to that. But if we decide to bring all the kids back to our full capacity and our staff back, we take even a much, much larger risk at this moment. So funding for payrolls to help us be able to pay our employees a livable wage because 1250 for an adult is just it just can't do it so the uh, feed the kids because they don't pay for their meals utilities i got three light bills in that building one across the street like three gas bills i mean like it's just hot so we just um asking for help with us i mean come look at our bus come and walk through our doors come and see exactly why we're asking for these funding and then you will know. Come and sit down with us and you will see. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rolanda. I am a partner here at AAA Fish House. It is owned by Allison Carson and myself. Um, some of the ways that we have been impacted by COVID, staffing for one has been one of our biggest issues. And like Tamika said, and Labricia, don't leave us out. You know, um, we are, it's very hard for us to pay our staff a livable wage. Um, we have come up to issues with our vendors, trying to get our products in, having to substitute products for other products. Um, if you all notice, it is a little warm in here, right? We got fans going on. Last year, we probably put, during COVID, where we weren't making any money, um, we put about 
$35,000 into repairing our air conditioning system in this building. My mom, she gets in there over those 80 pound fryers every day and makes it happen. We've had to close our doors multiple times this year for weeks at a time. AAA Fish House has never closed outside of their schedule except the week that we always plan to be off. And we're always closed the day after a holiday. We have been closed so many times this year that we have been back and forth where my mom is like, you know what, I don't even know if this is worth it. We pay a lot of money in rent to be where we are, but at the end of the day, the funds are there. So I feel like they should be allocated to all businesses where all businesses should have uh, access to those funds. Not just the funding, but the, like uh, also what the lady said, the education, um, the educational piece, extra information to make sure that we are filling out um, I'm sorry, we are filling out our financials correctly instead of getting downtown. They say, well, this isn't correct, but they never gave us the rubric to fill them out in the first place. And then every time you go down and speak with someone, it's always something different. It's never the same story. We've also had issues with, as we have our liquor license, we've had issues with making sure the distributors are getting, I'll, I'll order $1,500 in liquor and I'll get four bottles of liquor from the distributor. And then we're just out here looking crazy. So we can't, we cannot continue to provide the services that we provide if we don't have the help. Everyone is saying we're, vital, we're revitalizing the communities, we're building it up. Well, guess what? We're here. We want to be here to stay. So don't leave us out. I didn't expect to speak up here today, but um, I definitely feel like funds are needed for all businesses. Everyone has been greatly impacted since COVID. And it's been two years later, and we're still being impacted by everything. So I definitely am all for funding for everybody. I, like I said, I didn't have a speech to come up here with, but my name is Brianna. Everybody calls me Bri, and my business is Simply Flawless Hair Tea. Um, we, we, we're in the hair industry, so we were impacted greatly when it came to all of our products and things like that because we're with the export and things like that. So for us, the funding will be great. I wanna thank everybody for being here. My name is Lisa Potts. I am the co-vice president of a new initiative in St. Louis called Delmore Main Street. Uh, Delmore Main Street is a new initiative and it is a, partner, a state partnership with, the, with Missouri as well as the St. Louis Development Corporation. And our goal for being here is to help revitalize commercial corridors. We chose the boundaries of the city limits to tailor, so that's why we're talking about we want everybody to be treated equally and we're trying to bring equity to this process. It's about every business along this corridor. We're trying to help businesses that exist here. We don't want anybody displaced. We'd also like to be able to bring new businesses here. We'd also like opportunities for more businesses to own their properties. Tamika is one of the few businesses on this entire corridor that actually can say I'm a property owner. Everybody else is renting, two people. Out of the 30, 40 businesses that are here, only two actually own their property. And so there needs to be more equity around that. Um, I also chair what's called the, eco um, the Economic Vitality Committee. In particular, our committee is really charged with working directly with small businesses. So part of the reason we had you do a sign-in sheet and we're asking you questions. We want to be able to keep in touch with you to keep you informed about these types of opportunities. Sometimes we don't find out about information until the 11th hour, and we apologize for that, but we want to be able to get it to you quickly. So we want to get your email information. We want to know how to get into We want to create a Facebook group with just businesses so that when something happens, Tamika is our liaison, she sits on our board, that that information can be pushed out to you. We want to create a text messaging service we want to know what type of assistance you need. We've already had one meeting where we've had, we brought together businesses and we brought together the banks and we're talking about how do we bring access to capital. We need to be able to help you. We know e-commerce is an issue. If we need to come in and do an assessment, who needs new websites? Who's able to take money, you know, electronically, you know, with the cash app or either with, you know, the, um, the square? But what can we do to support you we can't do anything if we don't know. So what we want to do is really build this entrepreneurial ecosystem so that we can all help one another. We want SLDC to have a business and office right here on the block. How easy would it be, Lance, 
How easy would it be if you can just walk on Del Mar and get your questions answered about something that you need from the city of St. Louis as opposed to having to go downtown, find some place to park, go from the first floor to the second floor to the third floor, back to the first floor. I had a small business and I know what it's like. I ran a business for nine years in downtown St. Louis and it's hard getting help from the very people that are supposed to help you. Well, Main Street wants to help make this process easier for you. We have some other events going on really quickly. We're gonna sell it. We put on the Juneteenth event that happened all up and down the corridor. That was our first time putting that event on. We had over 800 people attend. We had 10 media hits. So we did that with your help. So our next event, we're planning to support Black Business Month, which is in August. It's gonna be held right here, inside and outside. We wanna do a business brunch out here in the courtyard. For the businesses that are on the corridor, we do not want to leave you out. We're going to create a process where people can have, we're going to call it business bingo or something. We'll help work through that, where people can actually come visit your establishments as well as the establishments that will be outside. But we want to work in partnership with you. Tell us what you need, and our role is to try to help you get it and help you succeed. This doesn't work without all of us. I also live in the 5800 block of Cabinet. I would love to just shop on Delmar. Do you think I want to drive all the way to North County or South County or West County to shop? I'd rather shop right here, but we don't have enough businesses here to help you know, build that. We want to build that up. We want to let all of our residents know that you can shop on Delmar. We're going to be supporting Small Business Saturday. So we're building lots of programs and activities to try to bring more businesses more business here for you. Our tagline is that if it does, we want to make cash registers ring, and we know you all would appreciate that. So, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Khatib Wahid, and I'm not a business owner in this community, but I'm a business consumer, and I'm a resident in this area. I probably will repeat some of the things that others have said. For example, Lisa's point about wanting to walk to get business, to shop. That's an important asset in this community. We do want to see this community grow. We want to see the boundaries go in, in terms of our community development efforts, not only from Del Mar to Page, but from Page to Dr. King, and Dr. King all the way down to St. Louis Avenue, and so forth and so on. What brought me here was a concern that was expressed by a few of the business leaders and owners here who felt that the current arrangement was inequitable, racially inequitable, right? So I don't want to pretend or purport to speak for the black business owners here. They've done that and they've done it well. But it seems to me that the arrangements that have been made based on HUD uh, census tracts in and of itself discriminates against those who are right outside that census tract because those boundaries were created during the redlining process that was extremely racist, and it still has an impact in this community. Now, we are very thankful for the fact that the focus is in in North St. Louis because it has been blighted and neglected for decades. But those, that data that is being used to decide where things will go is old data. In some of these neighborhoods, they're beginning to transition. People are moving in that once moved out. So I know that Lisa and Lance, I know the two of you all, and I applaud you for this, walked up and down Del Mar to take a look at what was here and what wasn't here. So data is not just numbers. Data is, is conversations from people, input from people, right, to pay attention to the impact that that's stopping on the south side of Del Mar has on the north side of Del Mar. That's an arbitrary line that Tamika referred to. So, we hope that we'll do a couple of things. One, and it was said in the beginning, if we can slow down just a little bit this implementation process to get more feedback from the people. I'm not sure how much feedback was given to the, all the persons who, de who developed this plan. I'm not knocking them, I'm not criticizing them, but I think it is important that even though they are elected, they may or may not be in touch with the people who are impacted by some of those decisions. So some kind of forum that allows people to talk about 
what does it mean, for example, with the boundary that stops at Page and goes down to Union? What about those black businesses that are south of Page, that are between Del Mar and Waterman, right? How are they impacted by these decisions? Are there opportunities for them to get help? In this stretch, it stops at Union and goes to Taylor. What about going from Union to the city limits? What is the impact? So I think this is good, Lance, that, you have, that you've agreed to be here. Uh, we applaud that. I hope that you will consider the fact that more money could be used and that we could create more corridors and extend some of the existing corridors. Lastly, this is not a proposal to knock out those communities that are going to, that have already been targeted and have already been told that they're going to benefit from this. We don't want them to lose anything. So that means you've got to add some more money to it as you add more to boundaries. So I appreciate having the opportunity to speak and I'm looking forward to some results. Regardless of what happens with this funding, we know the funding is here and it's gonna help some people. So for us, it's like a two-phase process. We're gonna help the people that we can help now while we're waiting for the other people to get the help that they need. We had a grant writing workshop last week, virtual, and we will send that recording out. We'll make, we have everybody's email now. It's gonna be posted on our website, but we will send that out to you as well. It is a basic, because we, as business owners, we understand that you might know, not know how to write a grant. And we understand that, but we're committed to helping you figure that out. So we have a free grant writing workshop that's already been pre-recorded that can be, will be shared with all of you. Next week, we are having an in-person grant writing workshop where we have actually, we're recruiting grant writers and we are going to match a grant writer with your business if you are interested and want that type of assistance. So we have professional grant writers. One of them is right here, raise your hand. My friend, she know I love her, Trina. <laughs> but we have professional grant writers who have agreed to volunteer their time and they will be matched with a business that wants help in putting forth of quality application. Because what we don't want you to do is put, send Lance an application and he was like, what is this? What are they asking for? This doesn't make sense, I don't get it. We don't want anybody's application rejected. So we're offering assistance. We're offering technical assistance to help you. We will make sure that you get a uh, link to be able to sign up. The, reg the class is gonna be held next week, next Tuesday the 12th at Better Family Life on their third floor. And we're gonna, gonna match people up with um, business, you know, with, with grant writers so that you can get the help that you need, so that you can get the expansion, so that you can you know, spruce up your e-commerce, so that you can get a new website. All those things that you do need that one day money is gonna be available for people to have. And, and it's just, it goes beyond this. This isn't gonna be the last grant opportunity that, that's available, not only from SLDC, there could be other grants, but we're gonna give you the resources to build your capacity so that the next time a grant is available, you know how to write that for yourself. But if you do need the help, we'll be there to support you. We're here as a resource, use us. It is gonna start at five o'clock, next Tuesday the 12th at Better Family Life. It's gonna be on the third floor. They, you, that you have to pre-register because again, we're trying to match you with a grant writer. And the only way we can do that is to register in advance. And we'll make sure that everybody gets the link. Okay, thank you. This moment in time is once in a lifetime almost. To be in a moment where there's resources flowing to this city, resources that are being committed to a part of our city that has been left out, I think it's also really thoughtful for us to consider what is the overarching impact. And so I think you all may feel in this moment we shared a story, but your story to me is really important because I'm a transplant. And so this information allows me to get real intimate with what's happening on this corridor as I continue to build my knowledge, my relationships with businesses across this city, but more specifically in North St. Louis. And so I'm gonna get to the nitty gritty. I think my friend Tamika wants to dive in on a couple of things. But before I do that, this video will be made available for your elected officials to be able to view. We will send a link to them about this so they have this information to help them make decisions as they move forward to be informed by businesses directly, not through Lance, through an email or a conversation, but from you directly. 
Uh, that's the one thing I've learned in my young years in this space is that the truth has to come from the person who's experiencing it in order for people to really know it's real. The third party thing doesn't work very well. And I think in this city, there's been so much de deprivation that your voices need to be elevated in a more intentional way. So with that being said, Board Bill 82, I think there was a very specific question asked around whether or not there would be a pause on this current application process. I can tell you all right now, there are conversations with some of your elected officials around legislating a new bill that would consider this section of Del Mar along with other parts of the city, not just including North City, but thinking about down page further, thinking about where are there are corridors in South City and Dutchtown that could benefit. It has also been made very clear that this is not going to be about pulling dollars from this current allocation to try to fund that extension. So just know your voices are being heard at the speed in which it's going to happen. I can't commit to that. But what I can commit to is me doing my job and moving the elevation and the story in the right place and me executing when you tell me to do something. That's the thing I can control. I think the other thing that came up uh, from Ms. Tamika is the notion of what are the, the types of resources specifically. So being able to have you all talk about things like accounting, things like e-commerce, those are things that I can actually do something about as we build out the Economic Empowerment Center that will be located on MLK. But as I hire my neighborhood managers, we'll have a point of contact for businesses on this corridor to go to and not have to go downtown. And I am hoping to find a community partner that will allow me to have a desk or a cube, if you will, for this person to be in community 50% of their time and not house out of downtown because I don't want to see my people because if I see them, they're not working. And so these are things that are really important to me is that we need to be in community to serve community. And I always say Dr. King did a phenomenal job in marches, but he also was in a lot of legislative conversations. And so we have to be bipolar in the sense of being in community with you all, but also trying to inform and educate our legislators about good policy. And right now we're in the throes of doing our very best to do the diligence of Board Bill 82 to make sure that the program does move forward in a conscious way, taking in consideration when we strive for equity, we always know that someone doesn't reap the same benefit. And I think this is a clear example that in an attempt to try to include the entire North City, the equation could have used a little more work. And so now we need to do the extra work to understand how we solve for that part of the equation that we didn't think about at the first time around. I will be sending out for all of you who signed up, you will get an electronic version of an impact statement. And based upon feedback from today, I will modify that statement to put some very specific things that you all can check. So the more I can have the check marks, around specific tasks or opportunities you all need, I can help create programming to bring those things to bear. So I will make some adjustments as I'm hearing information from this group tonight that will get some specific things on that impact statement about what you need to move your business to the next level. I gotta walk the streets myself before I can advise anyone else to do that. But when I mention my neighborhood management team as I bring them on board and doing interviews over the next month and a half, that will be a part of their job is to walk corridors. But in the meantime, I am seeking community partners along every single corridor in North City who would entertain a walk with me for me to actually do that walk with them, uh, to capture some of that information, to know who's the silent businesses who don't have the voice so that I can use a platform like this. Because every corridor, like we've done some good work with Del Mar Main Street, on this corridor, we want to replicate a community conversation with all businesses in the qualified area and then hold another conversation with the businesses who may be left out. Because I think it's really important to give voice across the board because the application, I know I've had my colleagues in the room say the application is complex. 
and it is to a certain degree because the legislation is a little complex. And so we want to make sure we provide the tools and the training to allow people to be successful. So the grant writing class that Del Mar has provided, that'll be made available for every corridor to be able to view, watch, and participate in and partake in. And hopefully I can find other community partners like Del Mar Main Street along other corridors who are willing to do the extra leg work with me. But I do have a small amount of dollars to support the engagement for this legislation. So I will be working to find partners that we might be in a relationship with to help do some deeper engagement as we move forward. So one, again, I want to say thank you uh, to AAA Fish, uh, great venue. Thank you to all of you for having the courage. So I want to say that again. Thank you all for having the courage to speak your truth in this moment because I know as entrepreneurs it's hard to tell somebody that you need help. So I encourage, I'm encouraged by your willingness to share your story. I will do my very best in service to help elevate your voice, to bring resources to bear to help you get things done in the way you need to. So with that, I'll say thank you, and we'll make sure that this video is sent out to all of you and that it's shared with your legislators and your policymakers for them to know exactly what you need. Thank you so very much, and stay cool this evening.